All right. Psalm 106. There's a parable that um, there's a parable that Jesus tells in Luke 15, and he talks about. He says, "Which one of you, if you have a hundred sheep and one of them was astray, which one of you would ninety nine uh, in a group by themselves and go back to find the one sheep that had gone missing?" And his point was, he was trying to illustrate God, uh, God's that even might have 99 sheep that are with there's one who he knows and who's wandering far away god's not just gonna write that sheep off he's going to go send someone to go illustrate his love for his people they don't love him at all or don't seem to care about anything he's done for him they just wander away and just wander away and couldn't care less god will still go and and get that and bring it back and uh someone's here for someone point with the parent the, the 91 that's lost is to explain that God does and will go and get what he needs to do and to bring them back. Hi, and you so, want to join us? Oh maybe next time. <laughs> Bye. So that 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 parable is really beautiful for our purposes here because that's the same kind of thing that the psalmist this, that's the same truth that the psalmist grabs hold of when things seem hopeless and you don't know how you're going to get a bad situation you're in and you could be to think that god doesn't care about you or that he's given up on you and forsaken you or that he's just he has things to do and better things to deal with psalm 106 grabs hold the same kind of hope and trust in god's love that jesus explained in his parable it's written by people who were exiles away from their home their families their jobs everything that gave them comfort and security has been ripped away from them they've been taken away to a foreign land all kinds of different situations and there's many psalms where they're crying the israelites are crying out and begging to be able to return looking for being able to return home back by the waters uh, back to where they to where they came from while they're while they're there by the waters of babylon they're waiting to go back to the land that god gave them and in that situation that's where we get psalm 106 where we see the psalmist recount all of the ways god has been faithful when the lost sheep who wandered away we don't care we've been given so much but we wander away anyway and every time god is always faithful to Go out and get us and bring us back. And that's what Psalm 106 is about. He starts off by asking, uh, asking the people to give God for his steadfast love endures forever. Verse 4, he asks to be remembered. Starting in verse 6, he goes on and recounts these big episodes of terrible sin over and over. I don't need to read all of them. God's people and their rescue from slavery, all this. But he tells it by way of explaining how unfaithful we've all been, but how God has all shown mercy. Starting in verse 16, he talks about the rebellion of the rebellion of Korah in Numbers 16. When men in the camp were Jacob, Moses, and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened and slowed up Dothan and covered the company of Ibrium. Also broke out in their company and the flame burned up the wicked. Talking about this moment of terrible rebellion when all these Levites gathered together and they tried to revolt against Moses. We don't, you're a loser. In charge, died and made you boss. We should be in charge as they're supposed to stay together in the wilderness following God. The leader did rebel, and instead of washing his hands of all of them, God punished the ones and 
had mercy on the people as a whole. And then in 1923, he tells another familiar story about God and building the golden calf to worship while Moses is literally receiving the Ten Commandments on the mountain. I mean, God is literally writing the Ten Commandments, worshiping this golden idol that they've, that they've uh, created. Verse 21 explains, they forgot God's Savior who'd done great things in Egypt. Sort of a, like a Janet Jack in a way of looking at the world. What have you done for me lately? Sort of thing. Um, it's not that they didn't know God had done those things. It had ceased to be, it just, it stopped being real. We can look back and say, it's nice that God, God sent Jesus and Jesus died on the cross and he rose again, but that was then. And my life is very difficult right now we can still have this, what have you done for me lately sort of mentality. So we shouldn't read this as, you know, these Israelites, they're just so foolish. We need to look at ourselves in the same position. We're the sheep who God has saved, but who always want to wander away and do something else and not seemingly not care and not remember how much love and grace God has shown to us. And instead of washing his hands of us, if we belong to him, he, he goes after us, and he grabs us and brings us back. It doesn't mean that we don't get into trouble along the way or we get stuck in some thicket or like try and go across a stream and almost drown, but he will go and get us and put us on his shoulders and he'll bring us back to the rest of the flock. And then he'll keep pushing the flock onward to the promised land. And more, more of them are going to wander away and he'll just gather them back up again and again and again. Verses 24 to 27, he recounts another. Um, another situation where the spies went into the land and they came back and they reported, um, yeah, this is what it looks like. This is what's happening. And the people, instead of saying, great, we need to trust God and just let's go take this land he's given us. They're like, no, we, we need to stay back. It's, we should stay here. It's not safe. They didn't trust God. So all that generation died in the wilderness, but he didn't punish all of them. Just that generation that was old enough to know better. He had mercy on their kids, and it's their kids who came into the promised land. So this whole psalm, he's just recounting these stories of our failure, his grace, our failure, his grace, our failure in his grace. Verses 28 to 31, he's talking about Numbers 25, the awful story of how the Israelites uh, ignored God and started consorting with pagan and prostitutes and were being corrupted by the false gods of the Canaanites around them. And now one with a, with a cultic prostitute in a tent while the rest of the congregations all crying and repenting before God. Verses 32 and 33, he talks about them murmuring in the wilderness, saying, we're sick of this stupid food you've given us. We're sick of Maconies. I'm tired of Maconies. Can we have anything else? I hate this. When he's the one who's supplying them in the wilderness, they're only alive because he's giving them food and water, and they still complain and grumble, and they, they don't want what he gives them. It was all organic. And it was all organic. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That was all around. I mean, the downfall of it all right there. No in the Bible. <laughs> 34 to 39, they talk about how they're supposed to go into the land. We, we saw in Deuteronomy uh, 7, they're supposed to go into the land. And they're supposed to wipe out those seven nations. They're supposed to judge them. They're supposed to destroy all of them so that when they get set in the land, to be a light for the G for Jesus who's going to come, they won't be corrupted by the influence of the of the world around them. They're supposed to make their own little world, their own little enclave of holiness in the land God gave them to draw people to themselves, so they can be holy people representing God while they wait for Jesus to come. But instead, they didn't drive them out, and they became corrupt. So that by the second generation, Judges chapter two says, "Hey, none of these people even know who God is." 
verses 40 to 43, he sort of sums up what the deal is. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations so that those who hated them ruled over them. He skipped way ahead to when God finally said, you know, I'm done with this. Not done forever, but I, you guys are going to be punished just like I said you would. And the northern kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC. And then 130, 140 years later, he let the Babylonians come and destroy the southern kingdom. They're all taken off into exile, ripped away from their families, their homes, their lives, their security. Everything that meant from God, from his, his physical presence, they're not there. They can't go see him in the temple anymore. He gave them in the hand of the nations so that those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them. They were brought into subjection under their power. And listen to this. Many times he delivered them. We've, he's given us this account of all these different times. Many times he delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity. That's always what happens. The shepherd doesn't make the sheep wander away. We just wander away. You know, we're supposed to follow our shepherd. And instead, we just wander off. In different, we all wander off in different ways, different reasons. We all wander off. And then Jesus is the one who goes and grabs us and brings us back and says, Now, what have I told you? You can't do this. I've told you what happens when you do this. But the reason why God uses the sheep analogy is because sheep, sheep don't really know what's good for them. They sort of wander around. I mean, they don't, they don't know anything. They're just, they're clueless. And God said, that's what, that's what you guys are like so often. He calls them stiff-necked, stubborn people, the Israelites, and us. So verse 44 is why this, psalm, this isn't a psalm of doom. The psalmist knows that's what the pattern is. But he's holding on to hope, which is in verse 44 to 46. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant, and he relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. He knows that God has been with his people, no matter what's happened to them. He punishes them like a father does, but doesn't mean he walks away and abandons them. And so now as they're in this situation, they're looking back at all the times this has happened before and God has always shown grace. Now, as we end our Psalm, on the basis of all that in their bad situation, knowing that they brought it upon themselves, they still cry out to God with this plea that's based on their whole history with him. And this plea should be ours too, as we go through difficult times. Save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. This, in verse 47, this can be our, this wish in verse 47, this can be ours too. Because we're waiting for Jesus to come back. We're waiting for our king to gather us from all over the world. We're waiting for the king to bring us from wherever we are in the world, to bring us to his kingdom before his throne so we can love him and worship him. That's what we're waiting for. That's what Revelation 21 and 22 shows us. We're waiting for that. They're waiting for it then. We're waiting for it now. And the only basis they have to make this plea in verse 47 Verse, uh, verses 44 to 46, is God made a promise. They're part of that promise. So they know, they know he's going to come back for them. They know he's going to come back for them. Part of his, we're part of the new covenant, your faith in Jesus. Whatever is going on in your life, it doesn't mean God won't punish you or make you deal with the consequences. It does mean that we can turn to God. We can tell him we're sorry and we can say, God,
and please help me. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. So this is a precious psalm of truth by people who are in a very bad situation. They look back at how God has shown grace in the past when it was never deserved, and they're like, we know you can do it again, and we're asking you to do it now. We're asking you to do it one day. And so we can say the exact same thing. That's Psalm 106. 